So I think we'll begin, and I'd like to welcome everybody here. My name is Mark Elliott. I'm the director of the Fairbanks Center for, uh, for Chinese Studies. And it's my uh, great uh, pleasure today and privilege to uh, welcome uh, all of you here and to welcome our speaker, uh, Ambassador Carl Eikenberry, uh, to the 2013 uh, Charles uh, Neuhauser Lecture, which, as uh, all of you probably know, is one of the signature events of the year here at the Fairbanks Center. Now, every year we have, uh, we have two big lectures, the Reichauer Lecture, which comes in the spring, uh, and this lecture, the Neuhauser Lecture, uh, in the fall. And these are very valuable opportunities for us to come together as a single community of, of China scholars and, and China watchers. Valuable both for the lectures themselves uh, and also because this is a rare chance for many of us who are extremely busy during the year to actually all get into the same room at, uh, at the same time. And it's really nice to see uh, many familiar faces and a lot of new faces. Uh, people who maybe aren't able to come to as many, uh, many events here as, as they might like. Now, this lecture is given in honor of Charles uh, Neuhauser, uh, or Charlie as he was known uh, to uh, some of his friends, but not, as I understand, to family members who adhered rigorously to calling him Charles, <laughs> except, for, except for his nephews, I believe. Uh, who's class of 53 and uh, a longtime uh, public servant and China hand uh, with close ties uh, to the center back when it wasn't yet the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies and it was the Harvard Center for East Asian Research. Now, we're told that uh, Charlie Neuhauser was, quote, a man of strong opinions and acerbic wit, which I think means he probably fit in very well here uh, <laughs> at, at Harvard. Uh, we know that John Fairbank, uh, who founded uh, this center, uh, himself was a man of strong opinions and very dry wit. Uh, Fairbank uh, believed very strongly in the ideal of serving both scholarship and public affairs. Uh, as many of you will know, uh, he himself took five years on leave from Harvard uh, uh, during World War II, uh, where he spent one year in Washington and then four years in uh, Chongqing. And he was then part of a large cadre of Harvard historians who, who uh, had been recruited by William Langer, one of the great uh, historians of diplomacy who taught for many years in uh, the uh, history department here and who was one of Fairbank's first professors, in fact, when Fairbank was a student, uh, recruited by them uh, to serve in the OSS. And Fairbank always welcomed uh, practitioners uh, here at the center. And in 1966, uh, he welcomed Charlie Neuhauser, who was then a senior analyst with uh, the CIA. And they spent a year here studying China and China's political developments uh, just at the time that the Cultural Revolution uh, was uh, getting underway and wrote a number of articles uh, that appeared in uh, uh, journals like the China Quarterly and Asian Survey uh, around that time, articles that were very uh, influential. Now, Charles Neuhauser died very young in 1987. And shortly after this, uh, his brother Paul uh, generously established uh, this lecture in his memory uh, soon afterwards. Uh, Paul himself uh, was class of 55, and he is here today with his wife Mary, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank them very much for their contributions and their generosity that have made this conversation about China, China scholarship, China and public service possible for these many years. So thank you very, very much. <laughs> the Neuhauser tradition began in, in 1989. Uh, and every year since then, we have invited a public intellectual to present some thoughts on Chinese politics, Chinese foreign relations, or on China watching itself uh, as a way of remembering uh, the way that Charlie Neuhauser managed so well to bridge the world between academia and public service and to connect China scholars with policymakers and members of the intelligence community. Of course, the ideal of a, of a scholar official uh, in one person is one that is uh, uh, very familiar in China. 
uh, this was the, uh, the goal of every uh, educated uh, man and probably the goal of more than one educated woman, although the opportunities for them uh, in the uh, imperial period were obviously very limited in this way. Uh, we know that uh, this was something that uh, for uh, centuries was regarded as the highest calling that anybody could aspire to. And we have seen our share of luminaries uh, who have uh, fit that description, who have answered that call in the uh, Neuhauser Lecture uh, Honor Roll. Uh, the first lecture was given by Richard Holbrook back in 1989. Uh, and later speakers have include, included people like Michael Oxenberg, Doug Powell, Stapleton Roy, Richard Solomon, Susan Shirk, Jim Lilly, and David Shambaugh, among many others. This year's speaker, Ambassador Carl Eikenberry, is another worthy in this long line of distinguished guests, and we are really greatly honored uh, that he's taken the time uh, to join us uh, today. We're particularly proud to welcome him because he is a product of our very own Regional Studies East Asia program, a graduate uh, of the RCA program of 1981, uh, and some of his teachers uh, are still here, Ezra, uh, was a mentor to uh, Carl, uh, as he has been a mentor to so many people uh, who have gone on to uh, very uh, notable careers in the public sphere uh, over these uh, many decades. Now, Carl's record is, is really quite remarkable, and if I were to read it all out, uh, we would be here for another half an hour. Uh, so I'll be, I'll be brief here. He's a West Point graduate. He studied, of course, here, as I mentioned, and also at Stanford. Uh, did a spell in the very early 1980s. Uh, at uh, Nanjing uh, University, uh, where he studied history. He's a man after my own heart. Uh, he is, uh, uh, he's been a fellow at the Kennedy School, and right now he is a William Perry Fellow in International Security at the Spoli Institute for International Studies at Stanford. He's held many positions of tremendous responsibility, not least serving as Chief of Mission in Kabul, uh, in China, he has been defense attache at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing and has served also as senior country director for China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Mongolia at the Department of Defense. In 2012, he was recognized by the graduate school here at Harvard for his contributions to public service with a centennial medal honoring him for uh, everything that he has done that's connected out of his studies uh, of East Asia that began here, and doubtless many more accolades await him down the line. But that will have to wait, because right now he belongs to us. <laughs> <laughs> His remarks today touch on a subject of great interest and importance to people <coughs> here at the center, across the country, really uh, all around uh, the world, as you see the title, The Possibilities and Limits of Sino-American Military Relations. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to our own Carl Eikenberry. <clears throat> well, Professor Elliot, Mark, thank you for those uh, very generous uh, words of introduction here. Mark had uh, offered to give a simultaneous translation of my presentation into Manchu and or Mongolian. And I said that was not uh, necessary, but thank you. <laughs> it, uh, it really is an honor. The honor is mine to be uh, at this uh, podium here this afternoon to deliver the 2013 Charles Neuhauser Memorial Lecture here at uh, this wonderful institution of Harvard University. I also, Mark, would uh, second your recognition of uh, Paul and uh, Mary Neuhauser for being the uh, benefactors for this wonderful lecture series. Thank you so much. Um, it's at this great institution of Harvard that, as Mark had said in 1979, I really began my serious focus studies of China and East Asia. And this was the first step on a professional path that was to take me to the Pentagon, serving in the office of Secretary of Defense Perry. Uh, as his senior country director for China. It was to take me to the United States Pacific Command in Honolulu, Hawaii, where I was the strategic uh, plans and policy officer. 
to the United States Army's 25th Infantry Division as an assistant uh, division commander uh, to China and Hong Kong on numerous assignments and uh, study opportunities, and also to the uh, demilitarized zone of Korea. So all that said, I give myself great credit for wisely pivoting to Asia 32 years before President Obama's administration did. <laughs> now, in this uh, audience here are some really wonderful faculty and uh, mentors, and Mark had already said, such as Professor Ezra Vogel here. Uh, Ezra, who really did do so much to spark what became a lifelong interest in Asia for me, and uh, more than that, help shape my strategic thinking about the Asia-Pacific region and security. And uh, a lot of uh, wonderful uh, friends in this audience as well, such as uh, Bob Ross, whose writings and views on China and Asia-Pacific security issues I continue to value to this day. And last, if I recall the names of who in the past years have been at this podium, which Mark did with some of those, I really am humbled to be standing here. I'm not going to mention those names because I do an injustice for not mentioning some who are on the list that I didn't get to. Collectively, though, I believe that they do represent the intellectual capital and really a lot of the policy machinery that's guided Sino-American relations and U.S.-Asia-Pacific strategy over the last several decades. To be permitted to join this band of brothers and sisters on that list, if only vicariously for a few hours here at the uh, Fairbanks Center, for me is a very special moment indeed. I'd like to uh, start with a personal story that speaks to the limit of knowledge and understanding, and a caveat as such, said before I begin my specific remarks on China. As Mark had mentioned during the introductory remarks, after 9-1-1, I spent a lot of time in Afghanistan, five of the next 10 years after 9-1-1 in Afghanistan, two military tours of uh, duty, the second as a commanding officer there, and uh, then a third as the U.S. ambassador. My first posting to Afghanistan was actually in October of 2002, and it came with very little advance notice. The uh, Secretary of Defense uh, called me to his office, told me to quickly pack my bags and get to Afghanistan with the mission of trying to build a new Afghan army and overseeing what was called security sector reform. So not long after that meeting, I arrived at uh, Bagram Air Base aboard a U.S. Air Force C-130 aircraft out of Manas in uh, Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. And so what did I do? I set about rapidly learning as I could, as much as I could, about the country of Afghanistan and the people. So I met with many Afghans right off the bat to learn about their culture, their history, their society. And one evening in Kabul, I hosted for dinner at the Khyber restaurant, a Brigadier General Asifi, who was the Afghan commander of their border police. Both of us were relying on my very good Dari interpreter, Dr. Najib, I not speaking Dari, and General Asifi not speaking English. And my young interpreter, Dr. Sahak Najib, uh, was superb and he could capture emotion and spirit at above the 100% level. But he wasn't a technical interpreter, so as he'd get more excited in conversations, the accuracy would sometimes come down. But that was okay. We weren't negotiating a nuclear arms control treaty at that point. And so I remember General Asifi was getting more and more animated as he's got this army general from the United States asking him questions about his history and traditions and more and more animated. And so I could see Dr. Najib, the interpreter, is getting more animated, but I could see his accuracy plunging, but on we went. And so finally, we got to the culminating point in the conversation, or from General Asifi's presentation about Afghan traditions. And Dr. Najib, now listen carefully, Dr. Najib's translation was, General Asifi has just said, we Afghan people, we have a long and proud history of inviting foreigners to our country and then hospitalizing them. Now, 
I think that what Dr. Nasheed meant to say was inviting foreigners to our country and then showing them great hospitality. But the fact is that over 10 years later, I'm still not certain. This is to make the point that experience on the ground does not necessarily translate to wisdom. So with that caveat up front, uh, a good number of years in China, a lot of time with the People's Liberation Army, but this is not necessarily wisdom that I'm about to uh, impart here. So with that, I thought I'd spend our time here this afternoon and what we can do is I'd like to talk to you about the possibilities and limits of Sino-American defense and military relations. And the way I'd like to do this is in three parts. First, I'd like to briefly discuss a history of USPRC military relations up until present. Second, then drawing on that history, I'll review the constraints that the two sides have faced and they continue to face in regularizing and expanding our defense and military ties. And third, I'd like to conclude by offering some thoughts on an appropriate framework for Sino-American military relations. So first of all, a short walk down memory lane, so to speak. And well, we just uh, hung up here. Oh, okay, great. Okay, thanks. So the first formal contacts, as this audience knows, between the United States uh, military and at that time the Communist Chinese Armed Forces, it begins with the second during the Second World War. From July the twenty second of nineteen forty four until March the eleventh of nineteen forty seven, well after the Second World War. In partnership with the United States Department of State, a mission was maintained at Mao's headquarters in Yan'an, and that was formally called the United States Army Observation Group. It was commonly known as the Dixie Mission. The Dixie Mission was initially considered the potential, was their mission was initially to consider the potential for Chinese Communist military operations against the Japanese Army, and later led by first General George Marshall and then by General Albert, Albert Wedemeyer, supported media mediation efforts between the nationalist and the communist. This mission is still remembered positively in PRC historical annals, but it was to have very sad professional consequences, as this audience also knows, for several of the senior US diplomats and indeed the soldiers who were assigned to the observation group. Over the next 25 years then, beyond the Dixie mission, subsequent military engagements between the United States and China were of a profoundly different kind. And to use today's parlance, the engagement of that era was often kinetic engagement. So in tragic succession, we have major engagements, including the Korean War, a reminder in which 35,000 United States military were killed in action estimated 132,000 members of the People's Liberation Army killed in action. There was the nationalist, communist, Chinese battles over and on the Taiwan Strait, importantly, with United States military material and advisory support to the Republic of China, proving critical during that era. And then the Vietnam War to follow, with the tables now turned and the People's Republic of China providing assistance to its ally, the North Vietnamese, providing them with critical assistance. However, the Sino-American split stimulated a new calculus in diplomacy in Washington and Beijing and led to a very stunning bold boss in Sino-American military relations. It's sometimes hard for us to remember that from 1979 to 1989, a period of 10 years, one of the key rationales for deepening U.S. and China ties was the need to cooperate and collaborate strategically and militarily against a common Soviet threat. In January of 1980, one year 
after the establishment of formal diplomatic ties between the United States and the People's Republic of China, Secretary of Defense Harold Brown travels to Beijing. At that time, the Christian Science Monitor reports as the visit is proceeding. Defense Secretary Harold Brown has begun his visit to China with a rousing condemnation of Soviet ap actions in Afghanistan and a suggestion that the United States and China could respond with complementary actions in the field of defense as well as diplomacy. Detailed discussions of the kind of technology transfers the Chinese desire in order to modernize their defense establishment are expected to be part of the dinner table discussions. Chen Shui Sun, an American educated rocketry expert and deputy chief of the Scientific and Technical Commission of the Defense Ministry will be present. A very different era. Now, I served as the assistant army attache in the United States Embassy in Beijing during those very heady years. The three pillars of the military relationship between the United States and China of that decade, they included high-level visits, included functional changes in operations, training, education, and logistics. And these were very specifically aimed to improve PLA capabilities. And there were selected U.S. arms sales and military technology transfers during this area. Now, this final category, they included the modernization of the avionics of a Chinese fighter jet, F-8. They included the modernization of Chinese ammunition factories, PLA procurements of U.S. torpedoes, the Mark 46. There was counter-artillery radar sales, the ANTPQ-37 firefinder radar, which I was involved with. And that radar, by the way, played an important role for the China, uh, Chinese PLA at that time because they were still fighting a war with Vietnam in which there were huge artillery duels going along no man's land. And there was also the purchase of 24 S-70C helicopters, more popular, that's a commercial version, more popularly known by the military variant, the Black Hawk helicopter. And I indeed remember as a much younger Army major standing in Lhasa on a visit there in 1987 and seeing a formation of PLA Black Hawk helicopters flying overhead. And then, of course, there was the covert intelligence cooperation aimed against the USSR and the combined efforts to work with China to help arm the Afghan Mujahideen in their proxy war, in our proxy war against the Soviet Red Army. These robust defense ties, though, of course, they all collapse on June the 4th, 1989, when President George H.W. Bush, shortly after the Tiananmen incident, he suspends military relations with and sales of defense equipment to the PRC in the wake of June 4th. Yet in retrospect now, as we look back, it seems clear that the weakening of the Soviet empire punctuated by the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of that empire on November the 9th, 1989, would have gradually diminished the appetite in the United States for purposeful U.S.-China defense relations, regardless of the Tiananmen incident. In short, the compelling strategic logic of that era, 1980s, for strong U.S.-China military cooperation, it ceased with the end of the Cold War. The Tiananmen incident, in my opinion, is a catalyst for the decline of the military relationship. It was not a cause. From 1993, then, through present, the Sino-American military and defense relationship has been best characterized as a wild roller coaster ride with every U.S. and Chinese president, from Bill Clinton to Barack Obama, from President Jiang Zemin to President Xi Jinping, affirming the importance of defense ties only to see them disrupted on a frequent but unpredictable basis. For example, subsequent to President Clinton's very successful June 1998 visit to Beijing, when I was there as the defense attache, the Department of Defense 
publication, The United States Security Strategy for the East Asia Pacific Region, which I believe, Ezra, you had a hand in uh, helping to uh, prepare. We continue, quoting, we continue to build the foundation for a long-term relationship with China based upon comprehensive engagement as reflected in the 1997 and 1998 clinton Jiang summits and typified by a range of military dialogues and security dialogues. So 15 years later, PRC President Xi Jinping told the media on the margins of his recent summit with President Obama at Sunnylands, quote, we should also improve and strengthen the military-to-military -military relationship between China and the United States and promote the building of a new model of military relationship between the two sides. So in fact, since 1993, the willingness of most senior political and military leaders on both sides, China and the United States, to publicly articulate support for positive bilateral defense relations has been both consistent and it's really been striking. These quotes that I read, you can go back at any point in time, almost from 1993 to the present, and you can find similar quotes from senior US and Chinese military and civilian leaders. Over the past 20 years, the military to military relationship coming up to present has been framed in various ways, and I'll take you through those. Most recently, in the 2013 Department of Defense annual report to Congress on military and security relations uh, developments involving the People's Republic of China, the constituent parts are described as the following. And the Chinese, by the way, the PLA, they would frame these slightly different, but not a lot differently. Five aspects. First, high-level visits. Secondly, recurrent exchanges, such as the meetings deriving from the Military Maritime Consultative Agreement, the Defense Consultative Talks, and meetings between the United States Defense POW, Missing Personnel Office with PLA Archivist. Academic exchanges, such as between our national defense universities and war colleges and service academies. Functional exchanges, which have included ship visits and in the fields of humanitarian assistance and disaster relief and military law. And lastly, joint exercises most recently and getting the most prominence now is joint anti-piracy exercises. In terms of the sheer volume of activity that's taken place, the results are modest, but they really aren't insubstantial. Some examples. There have been 11 Secretary of Defense, U.S. Secretary of Defense, or Chinese Minister of Defense visits back and forth over that 20-year period. Not bad, 11 over 20 years. With Secretary Hagel just having received an invitation, by the way, from the People's Liberation Army, to visit China next year, and he's agreed to that. There's been 15 or so naval ship visits between the two sides over these years. There's been an impressive number of Sino-American military educational and functional exchanges. However, in terms of sustainable and substantive results, that is making a qualitative assessment of the gains that we've had from defense relations over the past two decades, the results to date are very frankly meager. Two institutionalized dialogues, mechanisms for sustained defense strategic and policy talks were put in place between 1994 and 1997, between then Secretary of Defense William Perry and his PRC counterpart, then General Chur Hao Tien. These have been useful and they've also, to a degree, withstood the test of times. So these two major initiatives were the defense consultative talks, and these focus on defense and strategic policy issues, and the military maritime consultative agreement that offers a forum for the discussion of military maritime safety, operating procedures, and rules of the road. Also during the tenure of Secretary of Defense Perry, 
There was memorandums of understanding that were signed between the United States and People's Liberation Army Defense Universities and the medical departments of the two sides. These have also proven useful in underpinning relations between respective institutions, and more on this a bit later. Also, beginning in 2011, a security, what's called strategic security dialogue, led on the United States side by the principal deputy secretary of state, currently Bill Burns, and joined by the under secretary of defense and senior military officers, has been appended to the United States China Strategic and Economic Dialogue, a very positive development if it lasts. The sheer volume of interaction then, even if episodic, has undoubtedly provided opportunities for both sides to signal core interests between them, building a modicum of mutual respect and confidence that would be more problematic, I believe, in the absence of any such contact, and it has permitted us to better grasp the relationships between doctrine and strategy on the two sides. And clearly as well, most nations in the Asia-Pacific region, increasingly around the world, they'd prefer a world in which the United States and the Chinese militaries are talking to each other regularly and having professional exchanges rather than brooding and in splendid isolation doing war planning. So bringing the relationship up to present then, in 2013, by the end of the year, we'll have had seven high-level visits, eight recurrent exchanges. This is just over the past year. 11 academic exchanges, 14 functional-level exchanges, and three joint exercises. Of note, there has been three promising developments over the past year. First, the United States has extended an invitation to the Chinese Ministry of Defense, which has accepted PLA Navy participation for the first time in the Hawaii-based United States Pacific Fleet's biannual maritime exercise known as RIMPAC or the Rim of the Pacific 2014. The exercise aims to enhance the interoperability of the participating military forces while promoting regional stability. Second, there's been now the establishment of a U.S.-China cyber working group with military representatives from both nations meeting in advance of this year's strategic economic dialogue. And this marks the first formally or publicly acknowledged effort by the two sides to systematically explore the potentially destabilizing threat to future Sino-American relations posed by the ungoverned cyber domain. Third and last, there's been a tentative movement, a very tentative movement to include nuclear issues in defense dialogue, although previous attempts, uh, no pun intended, but appropriate given the topic, uh, subject matter here, have had very short half-lives. And uh, I'm, I'm not uh, certain how and at what pace these talks will proceed. So if in the main, though, the results of these really heavy investments over the year in terms of labor, time, and American and Chinese treasure into building predictable and meaningful U.S.-China defense relations have been so disappointing over the years. Why might this be the case? So I'd like to try to answer this question now in the second part of my talk. Since 1993, we've witnessed now five partial or complete suspensions of Sino-American defense and military relations. In 1995, 1996, this was triggered by beginning with President Lee dong huis visit to the United States of America, and then there was subsequent PLA missile firing exercises off of uh, Taiwan in 1995, 1996, and then finally in 1996, there's a U.S naval response to the missile firings that take place just before the Taiwan presidential elections. Then in 1990, I was in Taiwan, by the way, when Secretary Perry uh, announced the dispatch of the uh, carriers, and it was perceived in Taipei differently as it was perceived in Beijing, by the way. Uh, then in 1999, there was the very tragic accidental bombing by a U.S. NATO 
fighter aircraft, fighter bomber aircraft of the PRC Embassy in Belgrade. I was in Beijing serving at that time, and uh, that was a very, very difficult time because uh, the Chinese, uh, understandably, they believed that was a, a deliberate strike, and uh, I believe that, uh, that in their history, it will be many years, if ever, that that's not uh, described as a, a deliberate strike. It was a real tragedy. In 2001, uh, in the wake of the collision of a PLA Navy J-82 fighter, Navy fighter aircraft, and a U.S. Navy EP-3E Ares signals intelligence aircraft during Hainan, uh, that was operating near Hainan Island. Then there was, in 2008, after President George W. Bush's administration announced a $6.5 billion arms sales to Taiwan, which included the Apache helicopter shown there. And then again, in 2010, after the Obama administration announced a $6.4 billion arms sales package to Taiwan, which included the Patriot uh, variant uh, missile. These periodic disruptions in the relationship have made it very difficult to build trust between the two defense establishments. But having said this, why do political leaders on both sides not seek to better insulate the military relationship from these seismic shocks that occur every few years? I think that part of the explanation lies in equities of the two sides, the attributes of executive power, and the proper political and diplomatic calibration of signaling. Regarding equities, with last year's U.S.-China annual trade totals standing at 536 billion U.S. dollars and the PRC holding 1.3 trillion dollars in U.S. Treasury securities, it's not clear that either side would be very well served by testing the theory of mutually assured economic destruction by launching a first strike. Precision's hard to guarantee, and second and third order consequences very hard to predict. And with each year, it seems to me that the growing number of global and regional problems that require Sino-American dialogue and cooperation, be that climate change, global energy supply, proliferation, that these reduce the range of tools available to policymakers in Beijing and Washington, D.C. when dealing with an unexpected crisis related to defense and military issues. This is hardly the bilateral relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union in 1980 when President Carter signed a grain embargo order on Moscow subsequent to the Soviet Army's invasion of Afghanistan. In fact, this relationship is almost an inverse of that. So in short, the Sino-American military relationship today, as I indicated earlier, it's been modest in scope and temporarily suspending relations can pose, does pose, some inconvenience to those military officers who are getting ready for their trip to Hawaii or to Shanghai to discuss military medicine or law but the world will still survive. Damage would actually be quite limited. And since the presidents of both of our countries are also commanders in chief of their armed forces, the military relationship then is one of the few tools that they have immediately at their disposal and it makes their use in terms of suspending or downgrading military relations in the midst of a crisis one that's quite attractive. It can be a very timely response, and you can also control the response. Last, in terms of political signaling and diplomatic signaling, faced with a defense or a military-related crisis between the two countries, it usually does and can play well on the home front and often with external audiences when a chief executive or a commander-in-chief shows toughness and firmness and resolve by suspending military contacts. In fact, I think there's been occasions on both Washington and Beijing over the last several decades where failure to do so would have invited very sharp 
domestic political criticism. But these on-again, off-again nature of the United States-China defense ties are not the sole reason that military relations have been problematic in my mind since 1990. If the military relationship was manifestly indispensable, policymakers advised by their military leaders would find ways to preserve gains even during times of trouble, but they've not. And I attribute then this to three factors. First of all, structural differences. A first, first, a very small but enduring point worthy of mention is structural differences. The structure of the Department of Defense and the People's Liberation Army are sufficiently different that it's sometimes difficult to reach agreement in terms of the modalities for cooperation and exchange. The problems of interoperability, so to speak, at the policy level and the organizational level has proven very vexing. The PLA, for example, they have on their side no robust layer of civilian control. There's no Office of Secretary of Defense and associated civilian agencies. Nor does the PLA have an appreciation of the role of the United States Congress in maintaining and ordering the affairs of the American military. For example, the Congressional National Defense Authorization Act of 2000, still in effect, prohibits the Department of Defense from engaging in military exchanges with China in the areas of force projection operations, nuclear operations, advanced combined arms and joint combat operations, advanced logistical operations, or viewing chemical and biological defense and other capabilities related to weapons of mass destruction, surveillance and reconnaissance operations, joint warfighting experience, and other activities related to the transformation of warfare. That's a pretty heavy list, and that list is from the United States Congress, and it is the law. By contrast, for a country like the, uh, in which the Na National People's Congress is largely absent from debates about the Chinese military, the influence of Capitol Hill on matters of defense policy remains a great mystery, and I'm sure after the government shutdown episode, it's even greater mystery to them. The PLA recognizes the importance, for example, of the United States Pacific Command, a unified command, but understandably in China and the military, they want their primary communications to be with Washington, D.C. In the chief, the chief of the general staff of the Chinese military here, he's a counterpart to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff under our Secretary of Defense, but he is also the counterpart to the Chief of Staff of the United States Army. The Minister of Defense of China's portfolio is quite different from the portfolio of the Secretary of Defense, and the Minister of Defense of China, who has great personal prestige and influence, indeed, his particular portfolio, though, is limited to foreign affairs and foreign military relations. So I could go on at length. Add to this, though, that the PLA, they've had, in terms of continuity on their policy and intelligence side and in their protocol office, uh, those responsible for managing U.S. and China defense ties, they've had much more continuity than we've had on the United States side. We on the United States side, we have administration turnovers, we have military turnovers every two or three years. And so what you end up with is short-term memory on the United States. A lot of people that are working issues that uh, don't have a real historical perspective, they come into the jobs with a lot of gusto and enthusiasm, but uh, many times as they're sitting across from Chinese counterparts and Chinese counterparts are talking about the long relationship it's going right over the heads of Americans on the other side of the table. None of this, of course, does or should preclude the development of better defense relations, but given the severity of the already existing obstacles, they really don't make life a lot easier for those who are entrusted with oversight. I think a second and far more important reason for limited progress to date is what I would call strategic misalignment. 
Uh, Japan, at war with the United States, set the conditions for Colonel David Barrett to lead a successful Dixie mission to Yan'an, and similarly set the conditions for Secretary of Defense Harold Brown to have a pretty successful visit to Beijing in 1980. Yet today, while there's an ever-expanding number of topics for the United States Armed Forces and for the People's Liberation Army to productively discuss at the table, it's not at all evident yet in this very complicated world how all of these issue areas can be stitched together in some kind of compelling and coherent way. Now truly, the list of common interest, even in the security pro, uh, domain, is impressive. It's non-proliferation, accident avoidance, crises management, energy security I mentioned earlier, the stability on the Korean Peninsula, avoiding widespread collapse and disorder in the Middle East and Central Asia, counterterrorism, the list keeps going. But what role does the military itself, the PLA, the U.S. Armed Forces, play in any or all of these issues? And what are the interrelationships between these issue areas themselves? Moreover, I think that although you can give a complete enumeration of the list of common security interests, and you would look at this and say there's about an 80% commonality of of big strategic interests that are out there, global interests, you might find about 80% of that list was where we had common cause or common perspective. It's the remaining 10 to 20% of so-called respective core interest, which we disagree on, that for now occasionally tends to obscure all else. And I think that we ignore this reality at our own peril, the importance of the differences on the core interest. A third and related factor constraining the development for better bilateral defense relations is the divergence of goals and preferred approaches. The PLA still places great emphasis on what it terms the three obstacles to substantive improvements in military ties. What are these? Taiwan arms sales, special reconnaissance operations of the United States military off of China's coast, and restrictions on technology transfers dating back to the Tiananmen sanctions. Some would say that that third obstacle is not being articulated as much, but a new third obstacle has arisen, and that's U.S. alliance structures in the Asia-Pacific region. The issues are always present. They have always been present since Tiananmen although their salience has differed over time. But again, recall, as I mentioned earlier, that Beijing did suspend its military relations with the United States for five months in 2008, and then for 10 months as recently as 2010 in response to U.S. arms sales to Taiwan. In other words, I believe that China's political leadership, and one would assume the PLA high command, they place a premium on U.S.-China military relations as a means of conveying to American counterparts how China define, defines its core interest. Now, senior U.S. defense and military leaders, they've often lamented over the years that the Chinese have allowed the military relationship between the two countries to be held by po hostage by politics. I would disagree with that characterization. I think that Beijing has put the military relationship very much in the service of politics and diplomacy. Whether wisely or not is a different matter. Dave Finkelstein, a good friend and a very good scholar of the People's Liberation Army, wrote once, the PLA has been reluctant to engage in activities with a foreign military counterpart until they've achieved agreement on important strategic level principles the big issues, so to speak. Reaching agreement on major strategic issues is usually seen by the PLA and other Chinese foreign policy officials as a precondition for engaging on substantive military issues. By contrast, the United States diplomatic and military approach has been one of assuming that progressively building on practical demonstration of cooperation will have cascading effects and stands very much in contrast with the Chinese approach that I quoted Dave Finkelstein as explaining. The United States Department of Defense has a different set of 
expectations and a different set of priorities when it tries to set an agenda for U.S.-China defense and military relations. The United States, our Department of Defense, it traditionally prizes discussion on military transparency. It seeks more clarity on PLA capabilities, strategy, and intent. Moreover, it aims to reach agreement on operational rules of the road for military forces that find themselves operating in proximity and increasingly in so. It wants to focus on safety and accident prevention. So to illustrate the difference in these two approaches then, as David talked about China's approach against the U.S. approach, these different approaches and, and their priorities. To give an example, whereas the United States Navy is ever ready and willing to talk maritime safety with their Chinese sailor counterparts, those sailor counterparts will reply that if the United States military would just first stop its dangerous and provocative military activities in China's exclusive economic zones, then they'll be ready to talk about anything. Of late, the Department of Defense has expanded the list of desired areas for discussion with the PLA from rules of the road governing the maritime commons to the domains of the ungoverned commons of space and cyberspace and to nuclear deterrence and stockpile management. But these are issues that go beyond, far beyond, the exclusive purview and responsibilities and competencies of militaries. And this is a point that I'll come back to in just a moment. Now, I don't want to overemphasize the difference in priorities and approach. In fact, as China's economic and its military capabilities, its economic power and its military capabilities, as these continue to grow and its interest accordingly change, I think that there is the possibility for more areas of cooperation to expand or for areas of cooperation to further expand and maybe importantly for their value to each side to increase. For instance, I expect that China's willingness to participate in that joint maritime military exercise I referred to either RIMPAC 2014, I think this is a function in part that reflects China's growing self-confidence as a naval power, because indeed they hadn't been invited to participate before and had declined. And it does reflect an awareness of the reality that the security architecture of today's Asia-Pacific region is dependent still upon America's alliance structure. Beijing hopes, I think, to transform that security architecture to one over the next several decades or earlier that's not US-centric. But for now, I think that Beijing and the PLA, they resign themselves to the fact that they will operate within that existing framework even as China continues to amass strength. Let me conclude then with the third part and give you several thoughts about organizing and managing future US-China defense and military relations, drawing upon the lessons that I've talked about over the last several decades and the respective security interests of the United States and China. I'll offer four suggestions. First, understand the political context that we live within and be realistic. United States-China military and defense relations are going to prove very difficult to manage over the ne next several decades. That is a given. China's rising power, and it will increasingly challenge what the United States takes today still as its military prerogatives in the Asia-Pacific area. Michael Swain writes in his book, America's Challenge, to quote from him, basic U.S. assumptions regarding U.S. predominance in the Western Pacific and related norms affecting the rights and responsibilities of both coastal states and foreign military forces operating in that region might come under increasing pressure, perhaps intolerable pressure, for a variety of reasons. I share Michael's concern. Our military's task is to maintain its readiness and be prepared for an uncertain future. I believe that military diplomacy and appropriate military relations have their places. But at the end of the day, I believe what the American people hope to see is a Department of State that's working tirelessly to create across the board win-win situations with China, while they prefer to see a slightly, I'm going to emphasize a slightly skeptical 
Department of Defense that's one step behind. A frenetic pace of high-level military visits and numerous exchanges of military lawyers, doctors, environmental specialists, and the like does very, very little to change core security interest between the two sides that may be at sharp variance. Second, given the current structure will not bear a tremendous load, I'm talking about of military to military exchanges given our history. And we can we know it's going to be subjected to future shocks. Both sides really need to prioritize their efforts and weight them accordingly. So for the United States, I believe the military relationship should focus on improving through dialogue our very weak understanding of PLA's long-term strategy over the next 10 to 15 years, regionally and globally, and how the Chinese military strategy supports the PRC's comprehensive national security strategy. The United States itself needs to be prepared to speak with more candor about our own goals and objectives and concerns. Senior U.S. military visitors have had an opportunity to, uh, having an opportunity to go, say, aboard a PLA Navy Shang class submarine or PLA officers getting an opportunity to touch the fuselage of an F-35 uh, Lightning II stealth uh, fighter. That has some symbolic value in terms of signaling transparency and trust, but it does not substitute, in my mind, for serious, sober, and often difficult substantive exchanges on strategy and doctrine. We should also press to reach agreements, I believe, whenever possible, aimed at reducing the risk of accidents or incidents between our operational forces, one I mentioned earlier, the 2001 EP3E uh, downing at, uh, off of uh, Hainan Island, and between the United States Navy ship Impeccable and Chinese military maritime and air and naval forces in 2009. Such agreements must include protocols for communications and procedures for crises management after the inevitable incident occurs. The military maritime consultative agreement that I mentioned earlier does provide a reasonable basis for talks to proceed on, which to build, but it is restricted at present to the maritime domain. Attention has to be given to the domains of space, cyberspace, and nuclear weapons as well. This isn't to say that the United States should not make other investments in the Sino-American military relationship, such as encouraging PLA participation in productive bilateral or multinational exercises, such as RIMPAC, and operations build at aiming patterns of cooperation and increasing combined capacity to deal with such common threats as anti-piracy. Exchanges between junior officers should be given a higher priority than the often protocol-heavy and substance-like visits between generals and admirals. Still, we need to distinguish between what is essential in our military contact program with the People's Liberation Army and what is merely desirable. In an area of reduced defense spending, this becomes even more important. Third, those activities that are uh, considered essential, they need to be outfitted, as I say, with good shock absorbers. Now, former Secretary of Defense Perry, that's General Chur Hao Tian there, tasked me when I was his senior country director in the Pentagon in 1995 with institutionalizing defense policy talks, a military maritime dialogue between our operational forces and exchanges between our national defense universities. This task was assigned during a time where we had great congressional concern about U.S.-China military relations. By 1998, we did have in place a formally signed agreement establishing the Defense Consultative Talks, a military maritime consultative agreement, and the U.S. PLA NDU MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, governing academic exchanges. And with only several exceptions, these agreements have weathered the periodic storm in our bilateral relations. But a caveat, these shock absorbers, as I call them, they didn't just magically appear. They're not self-installing devices. Leadership is absolutely essential. And 
This leadership required at the level of Secretary of Defense, required sometimes occasionally by the presidents on the two sides. I'll tell you, without Secretary Perry's personal interest and occasional support from President Clinton in terms of his commitment of time with both his Chinese counterparts and within the Department of Defense, we would not have exceeded, succeeded. Fourth and last, Integrate military activities when appropriate. By integrate, what I mean is ensure we don't unwittingly militarize the discussions of security issues in our pursuit of dialogue with the PLA. Some conversations that take place in the security issue areas, they really are better civilian-led and military-supported. For example, I believe that exchanges on nuclear strategy and doctrine should be headed by civilian policy leaders. And discussions on space and cyberspace beyond narrow technical matters must include all relevant government and possibly private entities. In fact, adopting the model, which I'm pleased to see that's been started with the US-China Cyber Working Group I mentioned earlier, not only do many of these issues that we're talking about here go far beyond military boundaries, but we also run the risk of inappropriately empowering the PLA and eroding China's own civilian control of its armed forces by entering into exclusive conversations with the People's Liberation Army. Let me conclude with one forecast of potential futures. Now, the United States, according to the Institute of International Strategic Studies based in London, uh, the Global Military Balance 2013, according to their figures, U.S. defense spending represents about 41 percent of global totals. So that big pie there, that represents about over 40 percent of global defense spending compared to the rest, and that's all U.S. Number two is China. As their economies become number two, their defense spending right now is number two, but it's only about six or seven percent of the global total. You see all kinds of forecasts about the uh, growth of uh, China's economy and the, uh, the military. Let's just say that not the extreme estimates of Chinese growth in defense spending, but more of a moderate estimate of growth in Chinese defense spending, about following the same path as it has over the years, of the same percentage of GNP as it has. So as China's economy continues to grow, Chinese defense spending will continue to grow on about the same glide path and perhaps uh, accelerate it when it comes in terms of delivery of actual capabilities. It's not about quantity, it's about quality. So with those estimates then, what we see in about the year 2040, 2045, China and the United States are spending about the same on defense. Not the point that they're at parity, the point globally that at that point in time, then the forecast would say that overwhelmingly defense spending globally will be the United States and China combined. So as we remain the two major producers of carbon and throw it into the atmosphere, our militaries are on a path to dominate in another area. If this is so, if this is even remotely so, this is going to have very profound implications for the United States, for the PRC, and for global security. As we expect, the overall direction of Sino-American relations will be the key determinant in America's security and global influence well into the 21st century, the specifics of bilateral defense and military relationship will be a very important part of this calculus. So I'm hoping that my remarks here this afternoon provided some insights on the relationship, how it could be better framed and managed in the future with the goal, of course, of creating a sounder and a more sustainable defense relationship between the United States and the People's Republic of China. I'll stop there and open it up for questions.